have to say uh, towards the end there. Despair about the future really for the, uh, the Labour Party. But I think the emergence of Jeremy Corbyn has given us hope. And I remember actually there was a, uh, a satellite link with a conversation. Oh, it's just gone off again. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. There was a, a satellite link and a conversation uh, with, with Ken and uh, with, with Owen Jones. And there was a discussion at the time about the establishment of, of a new party. And, and I was... I was really, as I say, in a state of, of despair. And what is so wonderful for me, anyway, is the emergence of, of Jeremy Corbyn. But one of the things I think which is really key and came through that film when I first saw it, and, and certainly again today, is the words, and it was actually said in the film there, really, uh, that I remember my dad talking to me about that period. My dad, my mum and dad went through the, the Second World War. And, um, and some of the characters in the, in, in the documentary there said that they weren't prepared to go back, never again. And that was certainly something that I remember my dad saying that in conversations he was having with his colleagues in the, in the forces, that we can't go back to the 1930s. But one thing which is pretty clear, and there are echoes of, of today, I think, is that this was made possible by the emergence of a movement uh, and it was the fact that, you know, working class people, middle class people really came together and demanded a better future. Mm -hmm. And I think now people are coming together again, aren't they, to say, we've had enough of this. I know we haven't gone through a war, but we're demanding a better future. And I don't know if some of you were probably at the rally yesterday in Derby and in Matlock. And there was huge turnout to listen to the message of hope from Jeremy Corbyn. You may be wondering why I'm wearing this uh, women against state pension inequality sash today. We've got some members of the organisation uh, here today. Yes, give them a round of applause. Because, um, because that post-war settlement, that's an example, really, the post-war settlement that was broken, that promise that was established by the 1945 Labour government, which held sway for all those years. That's just one example of the post-war settlement that's been... Uh, that's been broken. But I get a sense of deja vu and the, the need really for uh, uh, planning around transport, around housing, around uh, education, all those things which are so important. One of the things and lessons which I think, and Ken, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. One of the lessons which I think, because that 1945 government, from my perspective, was fantastic. It was a seminal government, no doubt about it. Transformed society, created that post-war settlement that lasted 34 years. We've had a new neoliberal settlement, which has lasted even longer. But one of the mistakes I think it made, and again, this was touched on upon in the film, was it was, a lot of it was very much a top-down approach. And one of the things which I think is so hopeful about the vision that Jeremy is putting forward is very much a kind of bottom-up uh, approach. And John McDonnell's proposition, for example, the right to own. So when a capitalist organization decides that they're gonna asset strip a company or sell a company off to a foreign owner or whatever, but if we get into government, the workers in that company will be given the first right of refusal to take it over. And can you imagine the jobs which have gone to low-wage economies? Mm. Would they have gone had workers had that right? Would we have lost Selenies in Derby? Would we have lost Lee's Foundry? Would we have lost all the railway jobs which have gone? Would we have lost the tens of thousands, frankly, of Rolls-Royce jobs that have gone? I know Rolf Ross is still here, but this is the sort of thing which is happening. And so I think there's, 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 there's huge room, I think, for <coughs> optimism. And that film is a great source of, of inspiration. We need to learn from history. Yes, do some of the great things that, uh, that, were, that they did then, but also learn from some of the mistakes that were made. I don't know what your thoughts are about on that, Ken. Um, yes. Um, I, I think so. I, I, think, um, I, I think it's... I think it's very, it's very difficult, and I think it will be very difficult, because um, we will have the massed ranks of the power of international capital ranged against us. And I think we, we've seen in a very small degree um, what they're doing to, to stop Jeremy Corbyn uh, staying in the leadership. Um, I mean, the, the dirty tricks um, are just extraordinary. Um, I mean, the, the idea that, um, th that he should be referred to as hi him and his friends as stormtroopers mm. is stormtroopers. But the irony is 
the, the, the mass media are attacking Jeremy Corbyn for abuse. But, I mean, to be called a stormtrooper? You know, what, what, kind of, what kind of world do they live in? Um, so I think, I think we are, in terms of dirty tricks, we ain't seen nothing yet. And, and I think there will be more stories coming, coming out in the next few weeks. Um, I think the, um, the, the refusal to report the rallies that, um, that Jeremy Corbyn is doing, just not reported. So you have, unless you're part of it, you have no sense of the strength that he has. So the image, if you just look at the BBC, or you just read the papers, there's this kind of uh, isolated uh, elderly figure who um, you know, has only got stormtroopers for supporters mm. and is basically an anti-Semitic anyway. And, and it's, it, it is, it's deeply shocking. And I guess one of the most shocking things is the, the, um, the attacks from the Labour MPs of all the disgraceful things. I mean, you, you know what their calibre they are, most of them, in the, when, they, when they vote for that war, when they abstain on the welfare bill, which is going to be massive, it has meant massive cuts. You know what calibre of people they are. Um, but to actually destroy the party, um, at the time when the government was at its weakest, I mean, they were there for the take, taking. And to actually mount this onslaught um, and then say, well, well, you're not doing very well as leader. <laughs> well, no. I mean, if, if, if you were playing the game of football you know, and, and half the team left before the first whistle blew and then before the first half was very old, most of the others left every five minutes and walked to the touchline, you wouldn't blame the two or three that were left because they weren't scoring many goals, would you? you know, it's, it's, it's quite clear where the responsibility lies. So that, that, that has been shocking. Um, but uh, I don't know, I mean, we're really interested to, to, to know. I don't know if it's to put the house lights up a wee bit, is it? Because we're. Yeah, we want, we we want people obviously here. to uh, contribute to this. One, one yeah. co further comment I would make is yeah. that it looked like that uh, Momentum's uh, uh, parents and grandparents were alive and kicking. Uh, in that uh, film there when you saw Winston Churchill being booed because clearly that's yeah, yeah. abuse and can't be, uh, can't be tolerated, can it? Utterly mm -hmm. ridiculous mm -hmm. in a political mm -hmm. discourse in a democracy mm -hmm. that people can't make their feelings known in that way and to suggest and somehow characterise it as abuse and intimidation is yeah. utterly, utterly ridiculous. I've never heard anything so mm. stupid in my life. But anyway, mm. does anybody want to uh, make a contribution? So I'll come over with the, with the microphone there. Or, or is there a... Have they got a rope in my... Ah, great. There's one over there. Just there. Keith. Thanks. Thanks. Really great, Ken. Thank you for that. It's excellent to see it again. Um, I'm the national chair of uh, perhaps the most influential um, NHS campaigning group called Health Campaigns Together. And lots of my friends are in your film like Jackie and so on. Mm -hmm. And many of us in this room have campaigned over the last three or four years to say to people in the street, let's re-nationalise uh, the NHS by losing it to privatisation. And people said, no, that's not true, as the comment was on the film. What we couldn't do over the last three or four years, um, despite all the positive comments we got about believing the NHS should remain national public service, we hadn't a strong connection with the Labour Party. We wanted to say to people, let's connect the Labour Party and a good policy with our campaigning, which the people of this country believe in, to keep the national health, health service public. So I'm asking you the question, Ken, really is, what do you think the connection should be between campaigning organisations like NHS campaigns and the Labour Party? Um, well, I, I think it's, um, it, it's a good question. Um, I mean, the, the, the La I think you were quite right. I mean, the campaigns had to be separate from the Labour Party because the Labour Party was not interested. The Labour Party was part of the problem. Um, I think it's a political question, isn't it? Um, do, do we feel that the Labour Party now, or, or the struggle that is going on inside the Labour Party, does one side of that represent the interests of the campaign? Um, I think removing the private contractors from the health service is the critical demand, yeah. the absolute critical demand. Um, and so, I, I mean, my judgment, and I don't know if it's not for you to say, that, that I think the, the campaign should, should get behind Corbyn, obviously. Um, and actually make their feelings known about the rival candidates because, quite honestly, um, and I, I don't want to go into the private salesman business of 
Pfizer. I mean, I shouldn't mention the private sales, salesmanship of for Pfizer, but, um, oh dear, sorry. Um, um, but um, I, I, believe, uh, I believe that, that there was a quotation where he said if, um, if, 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 uh, if private companies can contribute to the health service, then it's fine. Uh, I forget the exact quote, but it's words to that effect. Um, I mean, the, the, this is quite clearly, if Corbyn goes, the politics go. I mean, we should be in no doubt about that. There is no other left winger who will do all the same things but be approved of by the Daily Mail. I mean, who are we kidding? The poli if Jeremy goes, the politics go. So I think, I think we, we, we have to stand four square there. I think there are other, other left wingers in the Parliamentary Labour Party. They just wouldn't get the nominations to get on the ballot paper. That is that's, that's a problem. So I think this whole project dies if, if Jeremy isn't re-elected. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. why it's absolutely vital and crucial that he does get back. But I think it's Martin in the back there just wants to, uh, yeah. Hi, uh, Mike Martin. I'm actually data manager for. Yes, what do you think, Mike? Hi, I'm Mike Martin. I'm actually data manager for Derbyshire Momentum. Uh, mm. the, the one, the one, one point I want, I want to make, I want to make is it's very clear why all the accusations about bullying, intimidation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are being directed against Momentum, because the Parliamentary Labour Party and the media, etc., realise that without the support of the Momentum Network and, and others, um, Jeremy is very, very exposed. And that's all I've got to say. Mm. Yeah, um, but, but, Well, I, th I, think, I think that's true. And I think what's, um, what makes him so scared is that he's not to be bought off. He's too old for that. Um, he's not to be bought off. Well, he's not too old, but you know what I mean. I mean, his, his legacy, his, his, his career as a politician is, is beyond reproach, and he's, he's not to be changed now. And I think he, he could be, not saying he will be, but he could be a real threat to British capital if he, if he, if he and the Labour, a new Labour Party can follow through on these ideas of taking back uh, the transport into public ownership, the, um, the Royal Mail. I mean, we have to question the the gas, the electric, the water, I mean, natural monopolies, as the guy said in the film, why on earth should they be subject to private, owned by private companies, to rip us off and drive us mad with their call centres? I mean, what, what, the, 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 the logic of Jeremy's position on the Royal Mail must extend across the economy. Now, if, if in that case, it is a real threat to capital. So, I mean, so I think that's why they're scared. And I think they're scared by the fact that suddenly the party membership has troubled. You know, this man who is grossly, totally uh, unpopular, will never get elected, but by some curious um, malfunction has troubled the membership of the party. Yeah. I mean, how bizarre to claim that he's not electable. So I think, I think they're scared. I think they're scared. And this is why The Guardian, you know, like, which poses as a kind of left-wing thing, um, now its, ta its tactic seems to be we'll put an anti-Corbyn article in and then we'll let a couple of letters in the letters page the following two days later. But, but I think they're scared. And I think it's, it's a real... I think it's a sliver of opportunity. I think it's no more than that because the forces ranged against us are colossal. It's a sliver of opportunity, but we've got to drive through it. And then the work begins. Then the work begins to get people in Parliament who will represent it, because we can't do anything until we do have that. So that, that's a big challenge, that, that finding a new, a new uh, group of MPs who will, re with the talent, with the experience, with the, with the world view, with the, with the professional experience, to really make it work. Because I think we, the... That, that, that's the, that's the, those are the troops we, tr wrong analogy, those are the people we need to, um, to make it work. We've got to have very talented, experienced people in that parliament to make it work. But it's a sliver of opportunity, no more than that. And the point is that the policies you've just outlined, Ken, are incredibly popular with the general public. And if only we could get the Parliamentary Labour Party, instead of focusing on undermining Jeremy mm -hmm. and the Westminster Circus, could actually start talking about the very policies that you've just articulated there, 
then I think we'd be flying in the opinion polls. I mean, it's, frankly, it's incredible that Labour's done as well as it has because they've been utterly sabotaged in, 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 in ahead of all of the by-elections and the local elections and, and all the rest of it. So, But anyway, Dick wanted to say something. There's a woman over there wanted to, to speak after that. I'll try and keep it as quick, quick as I can. The, the tendency is if you ask a question, you end up making a statement, I'm as guilty as anyone. Mm. A couple of things I noticed is fascinating because the sort of commentary you saw in the end of the film was like the dots which Jeremy Corbyn has, dotted, has joined up. And, and what is potentially there, and it was depressing at the time when you saw Ed Miliband caring capitalism, has suddenly sort of broken loose in his fashion. One thing that is probably on our side is, is social media makes an incredible difference because Jeremy Corbyn can put stuff directly to the people out there without the filter and distortion filter of the, of the media. So there's, that's probably something that is some um, point for optimism. The other thing I noticed in the, the early statements from the Labour minister at the time, they're just the purity of the language. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And all the language of spin, which has taken place in the last 30 years, is what people are revolting against. From my own mm. experience, I worked 42 years in the DWP and I was on a lot of strike action because there's such a bitterness at the top-down attitude of mm. management that did not treat us with respect. But one final qu question I was going to ask. In terms of filmmaking, obviously you've been a, a big, important feature of the um, over the last God knows how long. What, what prospects are there of any sort of um, alternative or radical filmmaking, television um, production that you see these days? Okay. Um, well, I mean, the, 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 the last question is interesting. Um, I mean, the, I think that the reform of what we call the media, horrible word, but um, the reform of the media, of the press and broadcasting is really essential because you can't have a functioning democracy unless you have the, the, the public prints and the the, 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 broadcasting, uh, the broadcasters are subject to democratic control like everyone else. And, and I think that the, 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 we, we've got to find a different way of organizing the press because the, to, have, to have a few rich people owning the means of communication is, is no free, it's, that's not freedom of the press. That, that, that's dominance by a handful of, of wealthy people pursuing their own interests and the, the the, broad, the state broadcasters exist by, um, it's, it's a top-down appointment system. Um, the government appoints the, um, the director general, uh, or it's a state appointment, uh, and the trustees, or whatever body they are, they're called now. And the, the heads of channels, everyone is appointed downwards from that. And they're looking for a safe pair of hands they're looking for people who understand. I mean, when I joined the BBC, I, you, would, you would have talks about the ethos of the BBC. Um, people who understand what the BBC stands for, and, and it is, although it's never declared, it is an arm of the state. It's an arm of the state. Um, and uh, so th th that has to change. Uh, and likewise, I think there has to be a new law regulating the press, which is about ownership and newspapers should be collectives um, or cooperatives um, with absolute freedom of the press, but the freedom for the journalists, the freedom for the print workers, or, or whatever the new technological equivalent is, the, the freedom for that collective to decide editorial policy and the stories and so on. So, and then you get a real diversity because you want diversity, obviously. Um, not just one opinion, not my opinion, but a, a diverse opinions. So I, need, I think we need new laws for the press to establish that. Okay, that's great, thank you. The woman over there. Oh, well, thanks very much. Um, mm. That was fantastic, Ken. I just want to say how inspirational I personally found that. Um, I wanted to make a point about education. It was one mm. of the sort of five areas that wasn't mm -hmm. covered in the film, interestingly, mm. and I wondered mm. kind of why you'd, you'd chosen to take that route. Um, but also, I think education is fundamental. I think you know consciousness raising in people comes through education. Not always the state-funded um, ed education system either. It can mm. through come through alternative 
forms of education like adult education, which was tremendously at its best, emancipatory, mm -hmm. and enabled people like my father, for instance, to go from being a minor to, uh, to Ruskin um, in Oxford. I think it's really important that we remember those old systems used to be there for the working class. And someone needs to be making a film about that because it's vanishing behind, around us. Um, I'm trying to put that right in. I'm writing my thesis, God help me, about this at the moment. But I think it's really important that that's captured somewhere. And you're the person to do it. I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> new project. I don't know about that. But um, I, I think um, uh, you, you make a very good point. And we were, we were conscious there, was, there were lots of things we left out. Um, I mean, the... Um, it was slightly more complicated in the, the um, I mean, one of the critical pieces of legislation was the 1944 Act, which in a way was a piece of class legislation to remove some of the brighter kids from the working class and put them into middle management or the professions to operate their system. So it's a very divisive piece, but, and we, there wasn't time to go into all that, and, but it, as a general point, I mean, you're absolutely right, and the, the old WEA was, uh, was, was uh, a terrific institution, um, as were all the elements that, um, of working class organizations at the beginning of the last century. You know, the choirs, the bands, the libraries, all those things. Um, and um, absolutely, no, you're right. Will you do a film then, Ken? Oh, God, no. I think it needs. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, well, you've got to find the you've got to find the right little kernel for the subject. You know, it's it's a bit general at the moment. But uh, I think you two need to have a conversation afterwards, and we'll okay. sort that. Anyway, yeah. you heard it here first. Yeah. Ken's next project. Anyway, uh, Kevin Curley, I think, at the back there. Um, it was great to see Kathy come home on the BBC um, again last month. I hadn't seen it for 50, 50 years, mm -hmm. um, and it remains a deeply moving. A drama about homelessness in this country and it led to the creation of uh, the national campaigning charity shelter um, almost 50 years ago and you were a, um, a strong supporter of that organization for a long time ken and then you decided uh, because of things that were going on to uh, dissociate yourself from it so my question really is um, when you look at the national charity campaigning organizations of which there are so many now in this country do you see them as part of the solution or as part of the problem um well, it's a really good question that and, and um I, I think it's complicated i think there are some some charities that are campaigning that do research um and there, there's some people involved in some of those big charities i think war on want has done some very good research and published it and um I mean, Oxfam has done some good research and, and published it, and, and that's been a resource for us to use. Um, so in that respect, I, th I think they're good. And obviously, I mean, they do fulfill a, a very human response, which is, you know, you see people in trouble, you want to, you want to give a hand, you know, you want to help. Um, but I think they're, I mean, as I'm sure we'd all agree, they are part of the problem when they become elevated, as they did by Cameron's government, um, into being part of uh, picking up the pieces for the Tory government's um, uh, policies. And, and the problem is charity has a... There are bad associations with charity. You know, you think of the Lady of the Manor going round on Christmas morning with sweets for the kids in the tied cottages. I mean, there's that kind of uh, patronising um, air where... Um, where people will donate something to salve their conscience, or great industrialists have ground their workers into the dirt and build their fortunes on exploitation or colonialism. But they're suddenly they are, you know, we have Rhodes Scholars, or we have the um, Carnegie Hall, or you know, the, all these things. So, so I think we want a world where. The, our good feelings of solidarity are expressed through our state institutions. That, that's, that's what takes care of it. Um, and that, that the idea of personal charity is, is, is minimal. Not saying it shouldn't be there, of course, you know, there's always something that you want to contribute to, and that's fine. But the big, the big issues, the, the state, our state that we elect, the people we, we put in those positions, they should, they should carry out 
our, in, our instincts for solidarity and mutual support. And that's actually what the welfare state is. That was the point of it. So that we don't need these big charities. So it's um, that balance and the use that the right-wing governments have made of charities and now that they incorporate them. I mean, shelter, where the, you're right, I had a problem with shelter when they were sacking people. And, and they now accept government contracts. A lot of charities ex get a lot of their money, I'm sure people here know this, get a lot of their money from government contracts. And then, of course, the, the edifice they build depends on those contracts. So then, so then they have to work in partnership. Um, and it's that, that partnership between the government and charities which is absolutely propping up a corrupt system and, and trading on people's generosity to support what is insupportable. And in addition to that, Ken, do you not think that the restrictions imposed upon charities make it more difficult for them to campaign yeah, yeah. with legislation yeah, yeah, that's yeah. been brought in of late? Yes, 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 absolutely. No, that's dead right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, OK, uh, there's a gentleman there. Is somebody keeping a, a tab, tabs of the time? Because we could go on forever otherwise, and I know Ken's got a train or whatever. Mm -hmm. will, will you come and tell us when, when, when we've got to wind up? Thanks, Finn. Uh, right, there's a gentleman there. Right, yes, uh, Billy Davis. Um, many years ago, there was someone called Margaret Thatcher who called, during the miners' strike, mm -hmm. the enemy within. Mm -hmm. Later, a film was produced which underlined the fact that the enemy within was not, in fact, the, main, the, the miners, but it was the police. What saddens me is that I, the term is now going to be used within the Labour Party, the enemy within, as far as Jeremy Corbyn is concerned, and that really, really saddens me. The fact is, my daughter joined, rejoined the Labour Party at the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. She's now found that she is not eligible to vote. Mm. And I think that is totally iniquitous. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Right, right. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, you, you think what? What? what, what and there is no reason to ban people except they think they're going to vote for Jeremy Corbyn. Exactly. It's the only reason they're banning them. Yeah. Um, and then for a, for a party of, of the working class to say you've got to pay twenty five pounds extra for the privilege, and people will be. Obviously, there will be people with not much money. Some people may be on benefits but wanting to take part. Some people may be very young, just don't have the 25 quid. I mean, the idea that there should be that financial penalty to take your democratic right is absolutely disgusting. And, and, but I hope it will rebound on them. I mean, who, who can justify that? Because it, the, the date was picked to damage Corbyn. The only reason to pick it. By the way, have you been unbanned, Ken? Sorry? Have you been unbanned? Um, no, well, I'm still a slippery customer. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a woman there. Long may that remain the case. Thank you very much. That was very kind of you. Um, I, too, am a new joiner. Never joined anything but in my life, but I've always voted Labour. Hmm. Um, and my, my bugbear... And my son calls me a keyboard warrior. I, um, it's homelessness. It's taking up from the chap up there. Um, I was very, very moved because at the beginning of your film, it was absolutely horrendous. People queuing, people scratching round for meals. And at the end of your film, we were watching people scratching round for meals again. And they were young men. Mm -hmm. Now, I have two sons. Similar age, there was a blonde chap who just stood out to me. And they could be my sons. Mm -hmm. And it's the one thing that makes me sick. We are supposed to be a civilised society. We are one of the biggest economies. Are we fifth? I don't know. But we're too rich to have people sleeping on the streets mm -hmm. or queuing for night shelters mm -hmm. and it's usually men women mm -hmm. usually get sorted but men mm -hmm. it's very often caused by mental illness as well mm -hmm. and this is because we now have what they call care in the community my backside and fanny malone i it's <laughs> dreadful <laughs> care in the community is toss the buggers on the streets we do not give us stuff mm -hmm. and i i'm sorry but it's the what it really upsets me 
I'm very lucky. I've got a roof over my head and I've got food in my fridge. Mm. And there's people... It's the year two bloody thousand. We've put men on the moon. We can order our shopping and miraculously it arrives. And we still have people sleeping on the streets. And in London, they put spikes in doorways. What kind of a society are we building? And I'm really sorry. I, I, uh, you can see how it <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a rant. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lady up in the, on the back uh, of, in, in the red. Uh, the red, uh, yep, the rant, so. Yeah, like everyone else, Ken, uh, really enjoyed the film. Mm -hmm. What I was interested in was uh, the great public utilities that have since been privatised after the 1945 government over, some of them, taken 30, even 40 years to get rid of. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, personally, that trying to renationalise one particular utility won't work because they're all interconnected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one example, I worked for many years in the power industry. I, for most of the time, I was a, a trade union activist. And I'm pleased you reminded me because it's that long ago. I can't remember when the, the year was, but it was 1989 when uh, the power industry was privatised. Within three years, these companies were making £4 million a day profit and they got rid of 50,000 workers... In, in an industry where, laughably, there were no compulsory redundancies. Now, they did that by sweeteners enhancing people's redundancy pay. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. what I'm coming on to, I don't know how many people realise, but before it was privatised, it was illegal to use natural gas from the North Sea to produce electricity because it was considered a scandalous waste of a natural resource. They built all these gas-fired stations up and, up and down the country to do away with staff. They only employed about 30 people, as opposed to about 600 people on a coal-fired station. And it reduced the projected 35-year North Sea gas uh, production down to an estimated 12 years. So mm -hmm. coming back to what I was saying, unless there's a commitment to actually publicly own a whole array of public utilities. I can't see it working. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think... I, I think... Sorry, just say very quickly. I mean, I think you make a very good point. And, and that's um, just re To think that we can just go back to what happened in '45 and stop there is, is probably not right. I mean, just dealing with the banks, for example. I mean, it, it, I mean their system is a pack of cards. And you, you know, you try and just try and take some out, the whole thing will collapse. So I, th I think it's it's a much bigger deal that we've got to deal with. And for that, we need international support. You know, we can't do it on our own. So I think we've got to be part of a European movement at least. You know, at least a, at least European wide, like Syriza, like Podemos, because the big corporations are very powerful. We have the whole inter, all the IMF, all the international banking organizations will be against us so we, we've got to think very carefully how if if Jeremy stays if he gets elected they will have to think very carefully how they don't fall like Theresa fell it, it's not it's it's the only way forward but I think it's 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 going to be very difficult no indeed I'll pick him off uh, Tez hello um thanks Ken um I worked with Jeremy Corbyn before he became an MP and we set up a section of a local authority as a collective cooperative. And what I like about Jeremy is he always talks about we, and that's really brought home when you listen to Owen Smith talking about I all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, meant, you referred to Clause 4 in the film, which was great. And we, I haven't regarded the um, Labour Party as the Labour Party since Kinnock and Blair, I believe, turned it into another version of the Tory party. <laughs> the one thing that Ed Miliband did, which has been really good, was to give us one person, one vote. 
And I think we've now got the chance to reclaim the Labour Party as the Labour Party for the people. And I don't believe it is going to come down to just Jeremy Corbyn because he believes in collective working. <laughs> we've all got to believe in that and we can make it happen. And I believe we will have Jeremy Corbyn as our next Prime Minister. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name's Karen, and some of you might have seen me before. Uh, I'm one of three million women in the UK that was born in the 1950s. And not many of you will know that for that crime of being born in the 1950s as a baby boomer, uh, in my case, 1954, when I believe austerity after the war was pretty much over. But now, we're actually finding that our ret expected retirement age at the age of 60 was actually taken away. And in my case, and in three million women's cases, you won't read about it very much, but we've had our state pension replaced by means-tested benefits if we qualify. Now, what I would suggest to Ken who I'm a great admirer of, because I've seen the trailer and I can't wait to see I, Daniel Blake. I would like to see a germ of an idea flourish of women in their 60s who have lost their pension and now a means-tested benefit because we've all been thrown together in common cause, but some of us haven't got anything in common with each other. And whilst I've been very political since I was probably 15, I'm now 62, some of these women have not been political at all. And they're regarded as a very soft target. And I just wondered if you would consider um, backing our cause. You would. Yeah, Thank yeah, you yeah. very much. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I probably just pitching for another possible film there, and maybe that's the second one that Ken I, I, can work on. I can't on, do, so I can't do them all, two. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> now then, um, did I see a woman uh, somewhere over, over in the back? Uh, is somebody at the back no. there? Would, no, no, sorry, I was got it wrong. Uh, somebody there, yes, at the back back row there. Hi, Ken. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm, I try and, I'm trying to be a filmmaker myself, and I was just curious um, what your opinion um, was on new media, what social issues filmmaking um, role is with this new media, because um, I feel like my generation does want to be engaged with, um, be engaged with these issues. Jeremy Corbyn's been a really good example of that. But um, I have a feeling that they've got a lot of distractions from um, cat videos and other things. So, so I'm just wondering, what do you think uh, um, filmmakers can do in a um, sense to help? Well, I, I think it's, um, it's usually complicated, really. I, I think they're, 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 the, the um, I mean, sh short um, pieces that are constructed can be constructed brilliantly, um, but that, that are made to be put out on the social media and um, is, um, is, is just a different, it's just a different form. Um, I mean, the kind of stuff I've done depends on a crew, it depends on a cameraman, on casting people, on you know, a crew of 20 or 30. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a project, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a group of people and you're together for at least five or six weeks when you're shooting it and it's, it takes a year, 18 months. And, and that's, that's one kind of filmmaking. Um, and, and I think another kind can be something done very, um, very simply, you know, with, with a small camera, with two or three people, um, and you, you can make whatever, you know, it's, it's not a limitation. It, it, well, it's a limitation in one respect, it's, it's, um, it's a freedom in another. Um, and I think the, the only thing I'd say is that if it's, if it's going out, you know, on, on a telephone or being received on a telephone or an iPad or whatever, then you've got to have regard for the impact that it'll make in that means of communication. Um, putting it on a, on a big screen like this, it may not work, but it might work better on a small screen that you can keep in your pocket 
than something I do on this screen. I think they're just different, you know, they're, they're, they're different. And the great virtue of, the, um, of, of making something for, for the so social media or, or whatever we call it, is it, it's very quick, it's very immediate. You know, you can do it and you communicate and you, you can be in touch with tens of thousands of people. So why not, you know? Why not? It, it, I mean, in the end, it boils down to a sequence of images, a soundtrack, and that's it. You know, that, that's what filmmaking is essentially very simple. You arrange for something to happen, then you film it, you know? Then you join the bits together. I mean, it's, you know, um, people go on courses for three years, but basically you can, you, 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 you can do it over a weekend and still go and watch the game. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not that tricky, to be honest. And, and I think if you have regard for the, for the, for the, me, the, the precise medium you're using, you know, go ahead, go for it. And, I, you know, it's no, no saying one is worth more than the other. They're just different. Thank you. Um, are we, yes, sir, go on. Yes, I, I agree with you, Ken, about the dirty tricks which we're going to face in the future. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen anything yet. Mm. Um, but to get back to the film and to be a little mm. more optimistic, mm. um, the, um, the historical commentary at one point early on in the film describing the election victory seemed to be saying that there was quite a lot of surprise that they, that they didn't really think that the Labour Party was going to win. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm a bit ignorant about that uh, part of it. it. Is that the case? Was there real surprise? Did, did the establishment think that the Labour Party wasn't going to win at the time? The, yeah, they the, the were very surprised, huge surprise. Um, I mean, Churchill was seen as invincible, you know, the, the great war hero. Um, and uh, I mean, they, they obviously forgot that he was excoriated, you know, in, in working class areas, particularly in the north. I mean, um, so he was, um, uh, he, he was no friend of the working class at all. Um, um, and, and his, his uh, how, he, how he operated in the general strike was, was shocking, absolutely shocking. And he wanted to take over the BBC. And there was, a, there was a, a standoff between him and Stanley Baldwin, who was the prime minister at the time of the general strike in 26. And Churchill wanted to take over the BBC and use it like he used the British Gazette as a kind of uh, propaganda tool against Baldwin. And Baldwin says, no, no, he says, don't be stupid. It's much better that people believe it's independent. Then they'll, be, they'll, they'll, they'll believe what they hear on the news. Much better they believe it's independent, but we'll control it. And of course they did. Um, but no, they, there was a great, it was a total surprise that, that Attlee won, um, which, you know, was akin to the surprise when Jeremy Corbyn won. And hopefully when he wins in 2020 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Welcome okay. there. Uh, my name's Rob Clark. Um, just very briefly, uh, harking back to one or two previous comments about the uh, different media channels that can be used, mm -hmm. I understand what you said earlier on about the power of the mainstream media being owned and influenced by the rich and powerful, the Murdochs and so forth. Um, just really as an observation that perhaps maybe the, the new emerging technologies that we can use to communicate and actually bypass all that blooming bullshine that they put out about our party and Jeremy Corbyn and so forth. Um, do you foresee um, your films um, moving more into that stream of media so that you can communicate your messages without the blacklisting that you've had to put up with in your past and so forth? Um, w I can't say I was actually blacklisted. I mean, I, I just got some things censored, but uh, I wasn't totally blacklisted. Um, I, th I think, um, not really, I, I think, I feel torn on this because clearly the new media is hugely powerful and, and this campaign has has benefited, couldn't exist without it. I mean, that's, the, that's what's different now is the new media. Equally, I don't want to give up on the, on the mainstream media. I mean, they should be ours. They, they have a, a democratic job to do and they should be held to that. So I, I think we shouldn't, um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't say, okay, you keep that and we'll just do our own thing. I think we've got to keep making demands that, that, that they do um, th th they're reformed, really. We just need a reformed media. So I don't think we should give up on that, really. And I, I, I think we should... I mean, a plank of... I would like to see a plank of the next election programme be press freedom. 
press freedom and not the freedom of the Rothermeers and the Murdochs to put out their story, the press freedom of all journalists and all newspaper workers and broadcast workers to, to work together, to have many varied stories and many different perspectives. Right, hi, um, I had a question about the uh, film itself. Mm. Um, I was just curious, what made you want to um, create a documentary? Um, well, because I think it was j just, uh, I was very aware that that generation was dying. The people who'd been young, and but young adults then, um, they were dying and those memories which were, had been really written out of history, out of popular history, were just not being heard. Um, and it's like th th that awful phrase, there is no alternative. Well, 1945 showed there was an alternative. Not entirely successful, made mistakes, but there was an alternative. So it was to say, this is, th this is a, a, a suggestion of the, where the alternative lies. Not this is the alternative. There's a suggestion that this is where the alternative may come from. Um, and so we just met all those people. And most of them, have, a lot of them have sadly died. Sam has died, Eileen Thompson's died, the older doctor you saw has died. Um, a lot of them have, sadly, Davy Hopper died a few yeah, weeks ago for the Durham mm -hmm. Miners leader. So um, a lot of the older people there have died, but their, their, their words were just um, very moving, you know, when I met them and when, when we recorded them and just hearing them speak. Um, so, I mean, it started with that wanting to record that generation. And it's true to say, is it, Ken, that, uh, I mean, Churchill was saying there was no alternative either, wasn't he? I mean, they were Same saying, thing. well, the country was broke, you couldn't, don't, you couldn't possibly uh, promise too much, uh, chaps, because uh, the country can't afford it. So yes, I think yes. I mean, that, that sort of philosophy of there was no alternative yes, yes, was yes. very prevalent at that time. And it just shows yes, that yes. where there is political will, you can actually make a difference. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, Ro. Hi, Rosemary from Derbyshire Dales, Labour Party. Good to see so many friends here. Well done. Um, Ken, thank you for a really interesting and informative documentary. And I was fascinated with some of the um, little sentences that maybe would really resonate from the 1945 manifesto, which are absolutely clear and still within our thinking. Not yet got there. So... Bearing in mind that the Parliamentary Labour Party, many of them, um, are not understanding what the people in the country are thinking, especially the members of the Labour Party, and obviously given the press, how do you feel that we, together, can really concentrate on sharing Jeremy's ideals and policies, which is, I think, which is, those are the two things that are really inspiring everybody to go to the rallies and listen to what he's been saying. Just um, before you come in, Ken, I think I've just been told we've got five minutes and there's a woman okay. there that wants to speak and a gentleman okay. there, and then we may, if we get time, we'll try and get some more in, but anyway. But, Ken, do you want, well, no, 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 no. I do, think you, you, do, do them together, yeah, okay, then yeah, yeah, let's try and get them in, okay. Hi, um, my question was about um, voting in general. I was thinking about of the social media that's been mentioned. A lot of younger people get their information that way. <coughs> Excuse me. And I've heard more about rallies and gatherings through social media. <coughs> Sorry. Do you think if we had compulsory voting in general elections in this country, it would make a difference? Take one more, Ken, then, yeah, to, to yeah, try and yeah, go, yeah. okay, then, just get this some money here, then. Yeah. Uh, the question, in the question on a, a, a similar subject, in, in 1945, there was a great uh, perceived need for change, which clearly the majority of people understood. There's a great need for change now, because we're surrounded by the disasters of failed industries, uh, Power, power generation is in collapse because of a lack of a national plan going back decades. Uh, the utilities are exploiting their, their customers left, right and centre, and a lot of industries have, have, have disappeared. Mm -hmm. The problem is that not everybody uh, perceives that to be a problem, and uh, in many cases have voted against their own interests, the two most recent being voting in a Tory government, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and more recently than that, Brexit. 
And uh, you know, there, there are waves of price increases which are going to hurt everyone mm -hmm. coming over the horizon as, as we sit here. But nevertheless, um, an awful lot of people uh, voted the wrong way in those two elections. As a communicator yourself, how do you think, uh, or, or what do you think is the, the best way of actually communicating in, in the present day world what the, the message is to get people back towards a socialist future? Um, oh, the, the big, big issues, really. Um, I mean, I think the, I mean, the, the, the two, the, 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 the two, the, 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 there are kind of really related. Uh, I mean, how do we communicate? I, I, I've no greater wisdom on this than, than anyone here. And, and the lessons from the fact that the membership troubled, has nearly troubled in the party, I mean, that is the answer. It has to be social media. It has to be talking to each other. It has to be, it's like a forest fire, isn't it? You know, it, it seems to be catching fire. Well, as we've said before, there will be a wave of dirty tricks, you know, to pour, to pour water on the fire, but we've got to keep it, keep it alive and keep it going. And I think because the, the objective reality is, is in our favour. You know, the, who would have believed that we would live in a world where food banks were the norm, where food banks were accepted? I mean, that is, if there's any one fact, that is deeply, deeply shocking. The people with families can't feed themselves without charity handouts. I mean, that is deeply, deeply shocking. And I think people know when they're being robbed. You know, they know they're being cheated. And I think we have to tap into that discontent. I mean, UKIP did it in an opportunist, right-wing way. And we now have to, we, we have to uh, use the same evidence, but, but to, to make a different case. Um, and I think what, you know, what, what, what um, so the, the, the person, the lady next to you was saying about, um, about what's inspirational. Um, I think it's, it's the broader, and I think that's what's interesting about 45. I mean, the people in 1945 weren't bothered about the, this resolution and that amendment. And they were saying, this is the world we want to live in. You know, we want to live in a world where we, we are our brother's keeper, we are our sister's keeper. And a world of generosity and kindness. And I think when, when Jeremy Corbyn was talking about a kind of politics, that's what he meant. He didn't, he didn't mean being kind to the opposition. He didn't mean being kind <laughs> to the Tories. And he didn't mean being kind to, the, well, I hope he didn't, meant, didn't, didn't mean being kind to the right-wing Labour MPs. I mean, he actually meant that society was based on mutual support. And, uh, and that's, that's the vision that, that, we have to, that we have to put forward. Um, but I think the objective facts are in our favour. I'm not sure about compulsory voting, I have to say. I, I, I don't know, to be honest. I, I haven't done the research. Um, but I think, I think it's a question of persuading people. And, and, and as, if it continues to catch fire, then it will, and the, the members continue to grow, and he gets him with a thumping majority. And he has the, then it's a challenge to those MPs and say, right, are you, are you working with the party or are you leaving? Because if you're leaving, time to go. And I think we need a new generation of MPs, people standing in, wait, waiting to, uh, for the next election, because we can't do without, we have to change them. I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, uh, another gentleman I wanted to speak, but I'm told we're absolutely out of uh, time. And, uh, and I think the key thing is giving people a reason to vote. If you give people a reason to vote, and the experience shows in Latin America, then people will turn out in their yeah, droves. Yeah. Can we please show our real appreciation to Kent? Okay. Okay. Thank, oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. As, um, thanks a lot. Um, as, the, um, as, as, as the poet said it, we are many, they are few. Yeah. <laughs>